Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Todd. Um, before I begin, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the program, uh, and what I would like to do uh, is to thank a few people who've, who've made this possible. Uh, uh, Rhiannon Phillips, I, I don't know if she's here or backstage, James Lees, uh, these are people who've put enormous effort and time into making sure this happened. There are a number of other people, uh, and I'd like you to join me in thanking them. Right. I, I also like to thank you uh, for taking part of your Saturday uh, to show up uh, and, to, and to listen. Uh, this is an honor for me to be here. Uh, and there is another group I'd like to thank. Uh, they're not here, uh, but they made what we do possible. Uh, without the janitorial staff, uh, we wouldn't be able to sit here. Um, <laughs> without, without the facilities people, we'd be doing this in the dark. Uh, Without the people who are serving us food, uh, you would all be in a bad mood while you were listening to me. Uh, and so I think we, we really have to acknowledge these people. Um, uh, and what I'm going to ask you to do, and I've asked, I asked the students to do this uh, as well a couple of days ago, uh, is to, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to close your eyes and imagine something for a minute. It's not going to be anything weird or, or, or creepy. Uh, I'm from New York. We don't do weird or creepy in New York. Uh, uh, but uh, what I want to do is sort of get a picture of somebody in your head. So I want you to, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to close my eyes. So I, if you actually don't close your eyes, I won't notice, but you will be cheating. S uh, and, and I want you to imagine somebody that you've come, come across today. So I'm closing my eyes now. And, and you can, it can be somebody who, who served coffee to you. Uh, it could be a, a bus driver. Uh, it could be uh, somebody uh, that, 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 that caught your eye on the street. Uh, it could be somebody who, who served the food here. And, and what I want you to do is imagine them because they have lives that are independent of you, but independent of your interaction with them, right? Your interaction with them was small, but you imagine that they go through their day. And when they go through their day, they're going to have hopes and fears. They're, gonna, they're going to have uh, a desire for their lives to be meaningful. Uh, they don't want to feel isolated and alone. This person that you're imagining, uh, they're going to come home either to a family or not to a family. Uh, they're going to sleep well or they're not going to sleep well. Uh, but they're going to engage in a life that is not your life, uh, but is a life that they have, right? Now, if you can open your eyes and just keep that person in mind as we go, because what I'm going to do, what I want to talk about with you uh, is in, in keeping with this idea of human decency, the idea, and it's very simple, it's simple to state, but it's hard to do, that other people have lives to live, uh, that they fear, th uh, that they often fear their death, that they don't want to be isolated, uh, that they want their lives to be uh, meaningful and worthwhile, and they would like others to find their lives to be meaningful and worthwhile. And that's each of us. Uh, and the core idea behind this idea of decency is not that we become moral saints, but that we navigate our way through the world, recognizing that those that we come across, and I'm going to talk a bit about those we don't come across, but that those that we come across are people who have lives just as we do, and allow that sensitivity of other people's lives to inform right, the way that we ourselves move through the world. And I'm going to ask you, uh, as we do this, to take a, a little, uh, just a small journey with me, uh, starting close to home and then working our way out uh, a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further, uh, so we can see how this form of navigation through the world might work. So we can start at home right, with your family. Uh, and one of the advantages of being with family or, or, or having family and friends is that we can see them. Uh, and in particular, we can see their faces. In other words, their humanity is, 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 is there before us. And it's an odd thing. I have uh, uh, three, well, they're not kids anymore. Uh, but when they were growing up, uh, you know how you get angry 
And when you get angry, you had this, stri- this thing happens that you don't really see their face, do you? Right? You're just, you're going at somebody and they become a bit anonymous. Whereas if you make their face something right, that is uh, salient for you, if you make their face something that is there and present to you, it's really hard to yell at them. Right? This is why having somebody that you're looking at uh, is, is very hard to get, to, to get really angry, but it's why also it's so easy to get angry on email, right? And we all know this. We say things on email that we would never say uh, if we were looking at a person's face. So what I try to do, uh, and, and I, I'm going to tell you things that I try to do, and I don't want to say I'm a model here because I fail more often than I succeed, is, is to, when I'm feeling angry with somebody that's in front of me, to force myself just to look at them, right? Look and see their face. It's, it's not moral sainthood, right? It's just recognizing there's another person out there, that person that I'm looking at, that person, right, who has a life to live, in my, you know, and, and you know when you have kids, right, that, that they have lives that are very independent. When you turn your back, they still have lives, particularly if they're adolescents. Uh, and so, so recognizing that, right, is recognizing them as another person, right, alongside you who has a life to live and allowing that, right, to, to invest you emotionally, right? So that's very close to home, right? Uh, I want to move one step further, uh, which are the strangers you meet. Uh, I, I, and these are the people you may have had in mind uh, as we, you know, as when I asked you to close your eyes. Right? Uh, there, uh, there are people that we come across that we interact with, and it's very easy to forget that they too have lives. They too have lives that are independent of us. And those lives that are independent of us Right, involve their hopes and fears and, and, and desire for meaning. Uh, and what we often refer to, I think, as common decency is a way of trying to recognize that. So there are v- various forms of common decency that we can engage in. One of the things that my wife taught me was the value of saying thank you. Uh, I, 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 just, I, I would take too much for granted. Uh, but when a person is thanked, Right? They are recognized f- as being somebody who did something for you and they didn't have to. And uh, the, uh, an- another form of this can be, you know, in a, in a traffic jam, right? And you let somebody in, and, and th- this is an interesting dynamic because you let somebody in and what's going to happen is the car behind you is more likely to let the next person in. Right. We, I, I, I was doing an interview where I was asked, do you think things that go around come around to people? And I said I was suspicious of that uh, and that my exhibit A was the current president of the U.S. Uh, <laughs> but that I wanted to think less in terms of what goes around comes around and more in terms of an idea of being able to pay it forward. Right? That you do something and, it, and you do something good and it sets a chain reaction. And common decency is funny that way, right? That it often will set chain reactions. People are the recipient of it, and they will pay it forward, right? That's, there's elements of that. When, uh, an, another lesson in, in common decency that, I, I, that I've tried to pick up, and, I, and again, I, I fail as often as I succeed, is when you see a homeless person, there's this tendency to try to do your level best to make sure that you, you don't see them and engage with them, right? That, they're, that they're, you, know, you pass them by. Uh, and so I, I worked with a homeless advocate for a little while, a, 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 a real moral saint uh, named Mitch Snyder. Uh, and what his encouragement was, he said, you, you don't have to give them money, just look at them. Uh, and, and so what I try to do sometimes, and I had this experience in New York where I'd seen a homeless person and I, uh, he asked for money, I gave him a dollar, and about half a block away, uh, there was another homeless person. Uh, and he, he asked for something, uh, and I knew I didn't have money, but I have Mitch Snyder in my head, and I, I turned, I said, man, I'm really sorry. I said, I, I just gave you know, a dollar to the guy half a block down from where you are. And he looked at me, he says, yeah, but you've you got to know I'm an independent operator, right? <laughs> uh, uh, 
which, which didn't get him the dollar, but, but did get a sort of human conversation going, uh, that we, we hung out a little bit. Uh, and, and, and that was simply a matter of common decency. Now, there was another example I used that, that I actually have in my book, which I, I've, I've come to regret, uh, because I was reading about various acts of common decency, and one of them was, well, when a, a, you're sitting in a meeting and somebody has a hot coffee and they get up to go to the bathroom, you can place your napkin over their cup and it will keep their cup warm. And I've used this several times and people say, no, that's just creepy. Uh, <laughs> the, you're spreading your germs. So, so I, I, I'm not commending that. Uh, you know, talking to the homeless person, yes. Napkin over the cup, maybe not so much. Um, but all of these then are ways of navigating through the world. Right, that allow us to see right, a, little more, a, a, a little more clearly right, a way of being with one another. Okay? So I'm going, to I'm going to take a next step. Um, uh, there is a step one might take to, to, to people that you don't see, and you don't see them for either of two reasons. One is they're far away, uh, and the second is they're not born yet. Right? They're going to be coming down the road. And, and th that second set, uh, is one of particular concern to us because of the climate crisis. Uh, and we, d we can't see them, we don't engage them the way we do with the people that we're with or with strangers that we meet. But here's, I think, where our imagination can help, right? I mean, I mean what you did in that, that one moment was you used your imagination to conjure up a life. And in using that imagination to conjure up a life, you were able then to be able to see your way, right? toward a life that was not in front of you. And I think we can begin to do that, develop that sensitivity toward people who are not with us, uh, but, who, uh, but who either are far away or who will be with us, and to the extent that we can, do something in our lives to be able to recognize that, right? Uh, now, I'm gonna move a little bit further out, right? Uh, to non-human animals. Uh, I'm not gonna tackle the environment, uh, David Haskell just did a brilliant job with that. Uh, um, and, but I, I want to talk a bit about non-human animals because we can imagine our way in there as well. Uh, we had uh, in my family a cat. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm going to confess to you, I, I don't like cats. Um, uh, I don't like pets and I'm ambivalent about all animals. Uh, I know David is not keen on hearing this. but, but. As I wrote the book, a funny thing happened to me, which is I started to think, you know, the cat, right, that I don't like, has a life. And it wouldn't kill me, right, to say hello, right, <laughs> to give it a snack, right, every once in a while. Uh, you know, we, we had, you know, when we, the only time I ever fed the cat was when the family would go away. And then the family would come back and the cat would look at me like, wait a minute, I thought we had something here, right? But I'm like, no, we didn't have anything, man. I, I just, but then as I'm writing the book, I'm thinking, you know, you can extend this a little bit, right, to the cat, right? So that imagination that we use, right, that, you know, we, we're, we're moving from the face of people we know, right, to strangers we interact with, to people that we won't see but can imagine, we can extend it one more step, right? And that step can be to non-human animals, right? Um, I, I should say that, that people found this odd about me, which is that I don't eat meat, uh, and I haven't for many years. Uh, and they said, well, you, how is this that you, you don't eat meat, but you don't like animals at all? And my response was, yes, but there's a lot of people I don't like, but I don't feel like I need to eat them, right? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, it was a lesson for me to try to develop a certain sensitivity toward this, right? Uh, so I'm going to take one more step, and it's not a step out, but it's a step in a very vexed place, which is into politics, uh, and particularly into a politics in which we are, uh, I, I'm sure this has happened to some extent here in Australia, uh, it, is, it, it is rife in the U.S., where, where we're very polarized, where it's hard for people to talk to one another. Uh, and uh, here I think the idea of recognizing that others have lives to live plays a very important role, but in playing that role, it's complicated. Because on the one hand, 
we want to recognize that people that we disagree with, people whose views are very divergent from us, are fellow people who have lives to live. Yet, on the other hand, right, we run the risk of just saying, well, yes, so I'm going to leave them alone, or they, you know, I'm going to have my view, and they're going to have their view. And, and, and some of these people, uh, their views are not okay. Right? The uh, racist views, anti-LGBTQ uh, views, the, the, the kind of thing that, that I'm, I'm working on in the US uh, where uh, pe pe uh, uh, undocumented workers right, are being dehumanized and humiliated. Right? Right? This is not okay. And people, have, uh, and people have asked, well, if it's not okay, right, how does the common decency work here? But in fact, right, there is an entire tradition uh, that can address this, and it is the tradition that actually w was the tradition that helped me to uh, develop the idea of decency as I'm presenting it to you. And that tradition is the tradition of nonviolence uh, that uh, and bequeathed to us largely theoretically, uh, but also practically, uh, by Gandhi and by Martin Luther King. Uh, and that tradition seeks always to recognize the humanity of the other on the one hand without necessarily agreeing with the other and in fact sometimes coercing the other. And people will sometimes ask, well how can you recognize the other as a human being with a life to live and still do things that might coerce the other? But here's where we have to understand the distinction between recognizing a person having a life to live, that they want their life to be meaningful, that they fear death, that they don't want to uh, be isolated, recognizing all those things, not violating all of those things, and yet forcing them right, to be able to go at them in another way. So for instance, right, uh, in the Philippines, when Ferdinand Marcos was deposed, right, what happened very broadly was that Ferdinand Marcos uh, had, there, there were two uh, general, uh, Filipino generals uh, that, that, that holed up in, in a military installation. Uh, he, uh, Marcus was sending his troops to arrest them. Uh, they, they got hold of the radio station. They sent word out to the Filipino people and they gathered. Uh, and essentially they said to the military, you're going to have to kill us right, in order to get to the generals. And the, and the Filipino military, the folks wouldn't do it. Right. They, put down, and that, they put down the guns, that was the end of the regime. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. being a country that has always coddled dictators, right, got, uh, uh, took Marcos out of the country uh, and, and back to the U.S. Uh, and his wife Imelda, who those uh, may recall had thousands of pairs of shoes, and I understand the shoes went with them. But, but they, when, they, when they went back, his, I mean, his his life was rearranged, but he did not have a meaningless life. He was able right, to, to reconstruct his life, even though he was forced through nonviolent action right, to live it differently. So I don't see that we are forced in recognizing the other, right, uh, recognizing people as having lives to live. I don't see that we are forced to exceed to whatever it is that they want. I don't think we're forced into any kind of moral relativism. Right? I think where we are is to recognize a bit of the limits of what under many circumstances we can do. Now, I don't want to say that all political action should be nonviolent. Uh, I don't want to say uh, uh, that in part because I don't think there's uh, a theory, uh, any given moral theory, including mine, that's going to be able to answer all the questions neatly and cleanly. But I think that if we take our default as nonviolence, then we can see our way right, toward engaging in political activity that still recognizes the other. And in the US, not being overwhelmed by it. Because there's a tendency, and, 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 and you know this probably from listening to this, that, 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 that Trump w is going to say something outrageous every day. right? Uh, and uh, and people, they get overwhelmed. And I tell people, look, and this is, I think, a, this is what, one of the things I mean by decency. Pick the issue that you're going to make better. Pick that issue and pick the amount of time that you have to put into it. And, and, and do that 
week after week, year after year, right? If you commit to that, sooner or later, Trump's not going to be here, but you will. And so what you need to do is not overwhelm yourself, not be a moral saint, right? But just decide what political move you're going to make and the time you can dedicate to it in order to make it better, right? And if we're seeing our way to all this, right, what we're doing, I think, is I, what I'm trying to, to, to picture with us is a way of moving through the world, right, that isn't characterized morally by burdens. Of course there will be burdens, right? There will be times when you have to do the right thing and you don't want to. But I think there's another way to conceive our moral lives if we're bringing it within ourselves the idea uh, that other people have lives to live and allowing that to settle into us as we move through the world. And that way of thinking, uh, or that way of being better, right, that way of being right, is to navigate the world not with a sense of moral burden, but perhaps, and this would be the project, uh, the one that I try, uh, the one that I'm in inviting uh, you, you to try, and the one that you, many of you in this room will do better than I, right? And, and navigating through the world with what we might call a sense of just moral grace. Right. Thank you.